Hello, everyone. So we're going to start now, I think. Uh, thank you all for coming. If you want to learn more about this series, I usually give a little bit of an introduction about what we do. To simplify things, you can just visit that QR code in the PowerPoint. That will tell you everything you need to know. We are going to be doing anonymous polling in the second half of this talk. Uh, I believe that there is the Slido code up there. Feel free to submit your questions before the talk, um, before they get to the Q&A portion, whatever you guys are thinking. And I'm going to let Vince and Don give their own intro. So if you guys could give them a round of applause, that'd be great. I'm Don Land. I'm a professor of chemistry since 1991. And for the last 20 years or so, also a professor in the forensic science graduate group and biotechnology group. Um, and I teach forensic scientists how to determine the presence and amounts of controlled substances. So back about 10 years ago, a local entrepreneur wanted to open a testing lab in town. And uh, he asked me if I could do it. And I said I could. And then he didn't pay me for a couple of years. And so I ended up taking the company and merging it with a first to market company. But I've been in the test, doing the testing of cannabis since 2010. And that's my story. Great. I'm Vince Lane, and I'm a UCD uh, alumni. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the advisory board for the UC Davis Cannabis and Hemp Center. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be here today. Hopefully today I'll be able to impart on my different experiences, how I fell into the industry a little bit by accident about six years ago, and now it's become quite a big part of my career. So I'm in multiple ventures globally, and we can talk about all these and talk about why this is a once-in-a-lifetime generational opportunity, and you're one of the first generations to actually be in it. So it's actually a very, very exciting time. Um, a lot of opportunity, very young industry, and we need people like you, so. Nice job. Uh, thanks. Um, so I, we're gonna have a little conversation. Uh, question and answer period will be later, but if we say something that jumps out at you, we could probably sneak in something. But uh, so I wanted to start off uh, asking you how the, I don't know if I want to call it a nebulous legal status is. So there's a, there's a UN treaty that 120 countries signed back in the 70s that is still a treaty. It's still a contract between countries that's in force. And so at the, there's this international law that is controlling the legality of chemist, or, uh, cannabis. rather. And then we've got the US federal government, which still has this Schedule I completely illegal status, and then we have all these states, and then there's plenty of other countries that are, I guess, bending to the UN treaty to, to do things. How has that affected kind of your role and the, the type of investors? And, and just, just give me a little feedback on it, what you see happen. Right. So I think just to kind of uh, level set the whole group, I mean, has anybody here not heard that California is legal for cannabis yet? Right, everybody's heard, right? So we now have 33 out of 50 states in the United States that are actually legalized for medical and recreational cannabis, right? So the big issue is right now every state has a different um, regu regulations, and in the US, obviously, we're making a big push. Now, the point you brought up is in terms of the international and also the market I play in um, from sort of the investor of private equity, so people giving money to actually start these um, firms. Uh, the THC side, so there's the THC and then like what they like to call the CBD hemp side, right? Because one is really, really like illegal in most countries. And then you have another one that's pretty much, it's becoming uh, accepted around the world globally, right? So I feel that it's challenging, but it, what it was even like two to three years ago was very, very challenging. And now it's lessening and lightening up. And a lot of investors that I work with are looking for cannabis-related um, opportunities. And just a, kind of an aside there. So prior to, oh, about the last year and a half or two, as you said, 
anytime I went off and did something and gave a presentation on cannabis, I would have to specifically say that I did not represent the University of California because cannabis is illegal at the federal level and they didn't want to lose federal funding, right? So I would have to specifically, every talk, every paper, everything I did had to have a specific disclaimer on it that in my activities in that space had nothing to do with the University of California. But now, if it's less than 0.3% THC, it's hemp, I can talk about it at the university. In fact, we're part of a cannabis research center right. group on campus, right? If it's greater than 0.3% THC, I can't talk, uh, it's, I'm no longer representing the university. So that's a big difference. And then when, when uh, uh, Vince talks about the hemp versus cannabis, that is, it is, Seriously, it is only a chemical difference. The genetics, right? It's, it's all the same species. Uh, it's just whether the, the THCA synthase is active or the CBDA synthase is active or both, right? That's basically what it comes down to. I, I'd like to bring up a point and, and get your take on it too, to the point that you just made. Uh, the industry, you know, a lot of people have been very hesitant to go into the industry just because it has a stigma. Like you're the first generation, one of the first generations that's actually coming out who actually know it as legal because you have to be 21 years of age and most of you are around that age um, if you're a student here. And you know you have sort of a sort of open view to the whole industry. Um, a lot of people that are in the industry, um, they have maybe multiple ventures. A lot of them won't even put that on their LinkedIn, right? Because they don't want to be judged. Um, a lot of people that I thought we're just in traditional businesses, have invested in cannabis business. Oh yeah, cannabis business, but we don't make that very public. Yes. It's still kind of very hush-hush, but that is changing. Like I have friends who have left good jobs at like McKesson and Twitter and gone and worked for cannabis companies. Um, it is becoming kind of, in the Bay Area, where I live, it's kind of been kind of like the cool thing to do now, right? Like you actually, there's so many opportunities and we'll talk a little bit more about those opportunities um, for students, um, so I'd love to get your thoughts too. Uh, yeah, well, I've obviously experienced the the same kind of thing. Um, I I like to joke with my colleagues that you know I've made it big in the cannabis industry. Wouldn't my parents be proud? Because my parents were born in the twenties, and they would not be proud, probably, other than the fact that I'm successful and that it does actually help people. So at this point. That stigma, 10 years ago, I'll tell you what, that stigma was a lot more serious than it is today. And that's good, that's a good thing because there's a lot of good that can come of it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of good evidence, not a lot of it produced in the United States because of the federal embargo against research in the United States, but there's a lot of good evidence out there about some very important medicinal aspects. Yeah. Uh, but obviously without having a bunch of studies out there, then you can always claim that there aren't enough studies. Right. <laughs> you bring up a good point because my uh, immigrant Chinese mother doesn't even sort of recognize that I'm actually working in the, working in the industry. She kind of just always says like, oh, so you're kind of, yeah, is it that stuff? Okay, all right, you know? And then just kind of like moves on very, very quickly. But that's even changing over time. And, you know, she can see that I'm getting more into it. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a work in progress, right? I think you'll see big changes in the next couple of years. Yep. Should we talk a little bit about, so we talk about cannabis, right? You being more on the educational side, why don't you tell us the difference between cannabis and hemp and the opportunities? So let me just frame it up. In terms of uh, cannabis, THC, um, they are projecting $15 billion in the United States for this year. And then in 2025, it's gonna move to 100 billion dollars and that number globally is even more exponential and that's only for the THC cannabis side right that doesn't even include hemp so Don you are very well versed at hemp maybe you could talk about the difference and sort of those industries and how they differ well so certainly the the cannabis industry uh, for high THC cannabis right it's all cannabis sativa L but the when it has the, C, the genetics for THC production. Basically, there's three synthases, right? A THC synthase, THCA synthase, CBDA synthase, and then another one that nobody ever finds. But it's basically those two or a mixture of them. And, uh, and in 
so hemp has been relatively legal in the world for a couple of decades now. People have been producing stuff in other countries. It's just the United States that has only been able to start kind of doing that since the 2014 Farm Bill passed. And now the 2018, uh, 20, uh, 2018 Farm Bill now is allowing that program to expand. They just came out with the new, uh, the new regulations. Uh, and like all new regulations, some of them make sense and some of them don't. Um, but hemp has been, you know, marketed around the world, and, and people could import hemp products into the United States. But you just couldn't grow it here, um, and so that's been going on for a long time. And and what makes hemp is again genetics. And so there are something like 50 approved hemp strains that have this low THC production, and that's been pretty good. So you can you can market that stuff all over the place and sell it into the United States, you just can't grow it here until recently. Uh, but the cannabis, the, the high THC cannabis sativa L, right, if it's got that other genetics in it, now that is the stuff that's really critically regulated, right? And it's specifically regulated, again, by this UN treaty that you can only use it for uh, medicine and research, right? And different governments, different national governments have different views on how to interpret that, right? Um, but it's still difficult to, uh, well, in the United States, nothing with more than 0.3% THC and it can cross state lines or get on an airplane or a boat or enter any kind of federal spaces. It's still federally illegal. And so that makes a huge difference and that means you can't import it or export it, right? right? And I don't know very many governments that are importing or exporting high THC stuff. No. It's only the hemp, it's only the CBD, because it's associated with hemp. Right. One thing I'd like to bring up is sort of frame up our next topic, is the whole thing about the industry and potential jobs. Yeah. So when I first entered the industry, I say accidentally, um, about six years ago, a lot of the people in the industry, there is a stigma, right? It's like there's going to be a lot of dudes and a lot of bros and a lot of people who are kind of like stoners. But then, you know, what the thing is, it's not about w what that stereotype is. What you're starting to see now is you're starting to see a lot of different people from all walks of life kind of move into the industry. So it's really diversifying and it's actually really upping the game. Right? So when I first entered about six years ago, it wasn't really run extremely professionally. But now, because you have investors and because of state regulations, you have to be very, very, very specific and run your business to the T. So what I like to talk about is, and I'm sure everybody here uh, that is a student would like to know is the different, you know, I've had students come up to me before and say, oh yeah, but you know, I studied X, Y, Z. How am I supposed to get a job and what are the jobs? And I think we could talk about maybe what jobs there are and some of the jobs that are that they wouldn't think about? Yeah. So you want to start it sure. up? Sure. Well, um, so I, I consult in a couple different areas, uh, one of which is the laboratory testing businesses. And I consult with labs in a dozen or 15 states and several other countries. And the rules are all different everywhere. But the rules have to be followed. And so you need compliance officers. You need legal teams. Um, you need special accounting, the bank system is all messed up with, because of the federal schedule one business, it's still hard to get money in and out of the system. And so there's, there's all, in addition to what you might expect, like agriculture, right? So there's agriculture, right? And there's the science of testing labs, but the compliance and the lawyers and the, and the accounting and, and having your website and developing brands Branding, and marketing, right. That is just a, a huge, so there's everything you can imagine, right, comes into this industry. So the, the, the markets out there are big. If you have a passion and you want, you know, can educate yourself a little bit and get in, get a foot in the door and get some experience, that, right, that's what everybody needs is experience. And, and I think you bring up a good point, too, because let's just take California, since we're all here right now, uh, it's only been legal for over just over two and a half years, maybe about two and a half years. So that gives you an opportunity. If you're coming out of in school right now, most of those people only have two years uh, of experience more than you. You have 
the opportunity to move into management, you have an opportunity to, to do a lot of different types of jobs in the industry. Um, it's a total, like no pun intended, a green field right now in terms of how the industry is actually kind of growing and evolving. And I will tell you from my experience, right, um, I, in California, have my own brands. I also have a co-founded a marketing company for cannabis and hemp. Um, so we see different brands and companies. We help them with the packaging, um, all the brand identity. Things are evolving, right? No longer is it going to be like a guy on a surfboard on a box. It's going to be, you know, real products selling, you know, to the public, right? And then on the other side, you know, I also deal in sort of the venture capital, private equity kind of world, and we have different types of ventures, and there's a lot of funds that are actually investing into a lot of these firms. So there's the financial services, once that changes, people think financial services, financial services could also be companies funding other funding companies also. Yep. Yeah. You're not, you're not going to say that Snoop Dogg's not going to be out there on a brand, are you? <laughs> I'm not going to say that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that is the fun part about right. the industry. There's a lot of people that I've met that are like, you know, whatever, celebrities like Snoop Dogg and um, Beast Tommy Mode. Tommy Chong. Tommy Chong, Beast Mode. Right. And I've met all these people, and it's really interesting, right? But they're typically sometimes they, they're funding the ventures or they're the face of it. Um, but there's a lot of big-time investors behind them, too, yep. putting in, like, hundreds of millions of yeah. dollars. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so I, I was just going to touch on some other stuff. So in the lab industry, you know, obviously, if you're a chemist, um, you can prep samples. If you get some more experience, you can run instrumentation. All the testing, there's all kinds of testing. It's different in every state and every country, but it's, there's a lot of testing. So there's a lot of, a lot of chemistry jobs. But the, it, like in most, most of the states that are going legal now, there are strict regulations, really lots of regulations, even on how to sample. So specific details on how a person has to go into the field and how to pick a, a randomly selected uh, relevant representative sample, right? Those people have to be trained. They don't necessarily need a chemistry degree or even a, a plant biology degree, right? Or anything like that. But there are rules associated with all of these things. And so, you know, drivers and, and uh, Customer service representatives, salespeople, um, everything from that to PhDs in bioinformatics and stuff, right? I mean, we have a lot of, so I work with uh, teams of geneticists that are looking for the magic hemp seeds that won't produce any THC and never go hot. Because I'll tell you what, if you're a farmer growing hemp and your crop goes just a little above 0.3% THC, you have to destroy it all. Destroy it all. That's a big bite to take. If you, that's your family farm or whatever, right? So there's a there's a lot of interest in the genetics. Um, turns out males and females. Uh, cannabis has two different plant sexes. There's males and females. Actually, it's males and not males. The the not males can sometimes produce male parts even though they're not males. But whatever, and a little bit of pollen. Gets out there, it's wind-blown pollen, and so it pollinates the whole field, and the yields go down by 30 to 50 percent. That's a big chunk to take, too, because you missed a couple of males or a couple of uh, what they call hermaphrodites, which aren't really. But So there's a, the, the, the genetics, the biology associated with it. There's, there's lots and lots of research and money being put in into developing, and that's for hemp, even, not just cannabis, right? So hemp as well as cannabis. So there's a lot of interesting kind of tendrils that this industry is just everywhere. Right. Kind of I like thought maybe we'd talk about the future of yeah. the industry and how that is yeah. going to create new opportunities. So maybe I could start off. Yeah. So I would say that cannabis is constantly evolving. The regulations, you know, we could argue either way, are going to become more lenient, right? I can't say there's going to be a nationwide um, legalization, but more states will go legal. Um, more opportunities for you. I think innovation is going to start taking place like it does in every type of industry. People are going to come in and be the disruptor. They're going to come in and create a product that actually will, you know, differentiate themselves from the market. So right now, what we're seeing is a lot of the same type of product. A lot of people are using the same centers, getting the same product, and it all kind of looks the same. 
I think in the future, the products evolve. Delivery methods um, actually, you know, I see all different kind of weird things, you know, coffee, um, you know, gummies, edibles, and then I see things like tampons, and, you know, it's just like it's going into every sector of, of you know, consumer goods. And on the international side, what I've seen is the reason that I like working on different industries, like I, I've consulted to two, a couple companies in the UK and also in um, Thailand and uh, Peru and, and also China is where we have our ventures. And what you start to see is it's, it's amazing when you actually go to those countries and their laws are so far behind ours. So it's like the movie Back to the Future. Like you literally know what the future is gonna look like, but they're just not living it right now. So like California, you know, we have, we're going like a thousand miles per hour. And then you go to somewhere like, um, China and it's like, oh, CBD is like heroin, you know, like this is so illegal. Uh, you couldn't even possibly think about ingesting it. You might get arrested. So yeah. I'd like to hear your thoughts too. Yeah. So certainly think things are loosening up. Things are loosening up more quickly in some places than others. It's, uh, you know, regulations are, are more and more being adopted everywhere that, that, has some kind of legality. There's some kind of regulations that you're going to have to go by. And, and often the way regulations are structured will influence the way corporations want to try and enter the market and take advantage of the markets. Uh, Mexico, Mexico, you cannot grow cannabis in Mexico, but you can, it's legal for companies, pharmaceutical companies to make products out of cannabis, but right. it's got to all be imported. Right, so now all of a sudden, importing, right, is really important there. Where, in some places like Thailand, you just grow as much as you need, right, right. and so on. Um, so, it's going to be a little bit difficult to predict how those things are going to change. But I think you're right. I think ultimately things are going to loosen. Um, the banking industry is a big issue, right? That that. Uh, is a difficult one for a lot of companies to get around. That's easing a little bit. I don't know, maybe you want to talk a, a little bit about kind of banking and insurance. And right. So actually, you know, the major uh, stumbling block for cannabis has always been like the banks won't take uh, your money, take your money, and then they won't actually be able to um, grant you any loans, you know, so you can grow. So most small businesses actually grow because they get a loan from a bank through credit, that type of thing. Those don't exist today. You can get those from obviously private firms and actually like smaller banks, but it's pretty amazing. Actually, the largest larger banks are actually opening up and allowing money that's generated from cannabis into the into the banks. And we're talking like Chase Bank. Yeah, and, and well, there was just some uh, some regulation at the federal level that went through, right? Isn't right. That, didn't that just go through not too long ago? It yep. Was kind of allowed or instructed the banks to to do that, not all of them did. But. And, and, and the cannabis industry adapted too, because one thing they thought they were gonna do is they thought they were gonna, oh, well, maybe we'll use cryptocurrency or right. something like that, right? But that didn't happen. And what they ended up doing is, just to get around the whole credit card uh, issue, is they actually use debit cards. So you can actually pay for your debit card and just take it directly out of your bank. So that's how they worked around that. We're getting close to being out of time for this one. Did you give us the five minute sign yet? Not yet. Oh, okay. So that, we got a little more time than, than that one. Okay. Um, well, so so futures. We should be talking about futures more, I guess. Um, I think in in delivery, right? A, a lot is going to depend on what kind of research can be done that will allow. Because right now for CBD. You, you can't make any claims. Right. There, there are no claims. And for THC, it's completely, right? You, you can make any claim you want because it's not really, right, in, in most places. But, um, but none of it is necessarily supported by research. So I think there's, there's, right now it's hard to get grants at universities because of this federal illegal thing. Um, and so there's only a handful of, of uh, of these types of programs on cannabis in the U.S. granted every year. Uh, that you have to get approval from the DEA and uh, the 
and NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse, right? And so I think there's going to there's going to be a lot of opportunities that it's just going to be hard to predict. I mean, we kind of have a view into the the reduction of tremors, reduction of seizure, seizures from CBD. Um, there's a few other things that have been shown. I mean, and THC is pain and insomnia, insomnia, anxiety. And, anxiety. Yeah, right. So the future is 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 wide open, right? I mean, there's just all kinds of things that might come out of this, but science is only one part of it, right? Marketing is only one part of it. It's right, and all these are going to open. Like for instance, I have a marketing company, but a lot of companies aren't marketing because they can't legally market right now. So we help them with building their brands and doing social media and, and some other things. But in terms of like putting ads out or doing press releases, they can't really do that yet. And that is changing also. And we're starting to see a lot more um, clients sign up because they actually need our help and our expertise. Um, it's interesting you mentioned we, I, our group just hosted the, large, uh, the first uh, hemp CBD conference in Asia. And when I was there, they are totally different. They make claims, they're like, cures cancer. It solves all your problems. I mean, literally, that's what it actually said. And it's amazing because they don't have those regulations. And there was another gentleman who actually has a company in America that was with me. And we were just like, wow, I can't believe this. Because in America, you would be almost basically arrested and fined, for sure, for making those claims. And in Asia, they were like, you pick the list. It does everything, you know. So right. it was actually pretty funny. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. We good? Anything that so. you can think of that we didn't cover? I think the Q and A no, is good. Q &A, I, More I, time for Q and A is we're always some better. Good questions. Yeah. Hit us with the hard ones. Well, not too hard. Hit Don with the hard ones. Maybe the easy ones. All right, so that takes us to the question and answer session. If you haven't submitted a question yet and you would like to, just go to slido.com on your mobile phone and use the code on the screen and submit your question. And we will start right at the very top. And you asked for controversial, so I'll give it to you. Uh, top question right now is, what should be done about the mass incarceration of people of color now that the cannabis uh, now that cannabis is legal and arguably uh, white people seem to be disproportionately uh, benefiting financially. Yeah, doesn't matter. Go ahead. You start. Well, I'm all about social equity. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, I'm obviously not a person of color, uh, but my brother was arrested in Wisconsin for having cannabis, and he luckily didn't spend a lot of time in, in prison or anything with it. Uh, but there is no reason anybody should be arrested for just simple possession and stuff of this. Uh, and, and it's, look, uh, people are biased, you know? So biased people apply laws in a biased fashion. Um, whatever we can do to eliminate that is what we should be doing for sure. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if I see a racial bias, but what I have seen in the cannabis industry is a lot of cities and counties will have what's called an equity applicant. Um, program, and it's typically who, people who have been incarcerated or um, disadvantaged, it doesn't have to be a certain race, can come into this program and they can actually get funding, they can actually get help from the city, and actually a larger company will actually pick them up and they will partner together. So they will actually work in the facility of that company, so albeit manufacturing, cultivation, what have it. So they are making strides in terms of uh, equalizing um, and I've seen, you know, people that have been arrested years ago, and it definitely, they, they weren't of color, so. It, yeah, right. So everybody who was arrested for this stuff should be let go. Yeah, they and, were let and, go. And, and, and that's going to be a big fraction of those are going to be people, a disproportionate fraction are going to be people of color because the laws were historically, traditionally applied, right? more stringently against people of color, for sure. And keeping with this sort of general theme, because I'm 
trying to organize the questions so they flow. There is a low rate of people of color and maybe other minority groups who are owning cannabis-related companies right now. What can be done uh, to start including more of those minority groups in the industry? What advice would you have? So I'll start. Okay. I'm a minority, and you know I started different companies, and I think it's really kind of comes from within, right, with any type of business. It, just because you have a different race or because you're a different gender doesn't make you at a disadvantage, right? You just need to get behind yourself and go for it. And I think as more people, if we're going to talk about minorities, as more minorities actually are women-led businesses start within this industry, people will follow. Because they'll be like, I saw that person do it. I'm probably smarter than that person. So I'm going to be able to do it too, you know? Or be inspired where they say, hey, I looked out there and you know there's people that look just like me and, and now I want it. I want to do that too because I, I think that's an interesting field. There certainly have been attempts at, at various local levels, uh, some, some major cities in California and other places that have attempted to, to write in the, the regulations to um, have some, some, uh, some help for minority-owned businesses. Um, I think it's not been real effective. The, the, I think the regulations in California I mean you've, you've got to have a team. You've got to have lawyers. You've got to have compliance people. You've got to have quality control people. It's really hard to sp start a small business in California, and that means that whoever's going to be starting that business has to have access to some capital to get started. And then, uh, do you want me to comment on whether access to capital has a racial bias? Because I don't think I'm qualified. I certainly have an opinion. I ain't right. <laughs> well, getting but, a little uh, it's not yeah. all, It's not ubiquitous either, right? I mean, there's, there's ways to do it. You gotta find a way, and, uh, but yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot of work to be done in that area, I think. Uh -huh. In other more established industries, there seem to be, I guess you could say, groups, organizations, nonprofits that are specifically geared towards helping get various minority groups involved in that industry. Would you say that cannabis is too new for that to be the case, or are you seeing that start to emerge? No, I, I think they are already creating programs. Like I mentioned, the equity applicant program in most cities, those are actually targeted to help disadvantaged and minorities become um, more relevant in the industry. So, what are uh, they called? equity applicant. Applicant? Yeah, equity applicant programs, EAA programs. And those are, those are different from one community to another, right? They are and those different. Are, they're very localized. Yeah. yeah, so if you want, localized. you can always just Google certain city cannabis equity applicant requirements and then something will come up. Yeah. Getting a little more broad, uh, another question that's at the top right now is what kind of jobs are there in the industry post-graduation besides being a bud tender, I assume, what kind of entry-level jobs? Well, I mean, on the, I'm going to take Don's thunder and say on the science side, you could work in a lab, right? You can work in a cultivation facility where you could actually be uh, a gardener. Um, you can be one who monitors all the chemicals or the, sorry, the, excuse, I should say chemicals, the nutrients for all the, the different types of plants. Um, on the other side, being a bud, te bud tender is just being in a dispensary. Um, there's now companies with like full-blown marketing companies, uh, marketing, uh, you know, groups within their company. Uh, they have salespeople. They have um, people of like, most of the people are executives because there are so few people in some of these companies. So those are some typical jobs. They need an accountant. They need a lawyer, right? Any job that you would do at any other big firm, most likely you could do at this this industry. Yeah, yeah. I, that's it's anything you can think of. The industry has that drivers. Uh, yeah, delivery, custody. processing people. Processing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think. In the, in the marketing and stuff, there's, there's 
all of these companies have websites, right? And they need it to be managed and to be useful. And so there's, there's, you know, shoot, there's, you know, uh, like the the data, the big data analysis kinds of stuff is, is you know, less frequent. But there's several com com uh, companies out there that are trying to gather the the uh, what we used to call patient responses, right? So incentivize people to fill out a form on a website about this is the strain that I used, this is what I wanted it to do, this is what it actually did, and putting that stuff into a database and trying to figure out how people can get that information out in a useful way that can guide them, right? And that's, a, that's hard. There's a lot of people that are, are trying to do it in different ways, so there's that kind of thing. I mean, it's just yeah. a, anything you can imagine. Yeah, next huh? question. And we got another question that's more of a little oddball, fun question, which is, what are some of the strangest or most fascinating cannabis products that you've seen being created these past few years? <laughs> you name it. Boy, oh boy, you name it. It's, you know, they've tried it in everything. At a testing lab, I've seen it all. It's in everything. One of, the, one of the products I saw in the UK is they have a, a device like a Fitbit, and actually you can set it, and it will actually release uh, CBD into your skin topically. So it's kind of like it just works through the, the device, and it actually seeps into your skin on a, on a regular basis too. So you actually get that into your system. Yeah, I mean, California started as a medical Right, so it was a, a medical only state, and uh, didn't go fully recreational until just a couple of years ago. So. I got, I got one. Yeah. Okay. So um, my friends who are in the industry, they own like these large dispensaries, so they like to see, they get to see a lot of the big good products. One product that Cal the state of California has been blocking, which I think is a complete disruptor, is they've actually um, genetically altered one of the THC strains, and they actually. They said, okay, Vince, when you drink it, you go, I'm starting to get a little bit buzzed. And then after three or four year all, I'm starting to kind of feel like I'm drunk. Now, if that ever hits the market, right? And we all know cannabis is legal already. If they can get that to the market, that's gonna disrupt trillion dollar industry with alcohol. Um, because now you have no calories, right? It's organic and you can add it just to water. And have it. Was, was these little pouches of, of powder? I've seen no. that. It's a little oh, we have you. Yeah, no, it was, a, it was a liquid. Powder it was a liquid. dispersed in like sugars yeah. and stuff. Which I thought yeah. was very, very fascinating. So obviously there's patches, there's suppositories, uh, right? There's uh, every kind of smoking, vaping yeah. device. Um, and you won't destroy sauce, your liver either. Hot sauce, wine. Yeah. Yeah, you know, fruit roll-ups. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah we can yeah, sit here all day yeah. and name everything in the goodie aisle. Yeah. Another question is, do you have any recommendations for the best cannabis conventions and or networking events that students can go to? Well, so, I mean... The Maybe we can broaden it to any resource. Maybe it's an online resource. Maybe it's a networking events, conventions yep. locally, resources that you think students would benefit from. Can I start? Yeah. If, you, if, you're, gonna at, if you're gonna look at if you're gonna look at conferences, um, you know you've got the largest one in the United States is called MJ BizCon, right? But MJ BizCon ends up being a lot of vendors and it's kind of a walking around. They do breakout sessions, but it's very, very big, right? Now, if you're a student, you may want to focus more on the smaller ones. So in Santa Rosa, there's one that's very, very popular. Everybody goes to, it's called Hall of Flowers. And then additionally, there's one, um, it's in like San Jose and they have it somewhere else. And it's N NCIA is the acronym that they use. And that's actually a, a very good place also. But in, in terms of you, what are they, you know, it depends on what they're networking for. If they're networking to get into the industry or jobs, most people are pretty, in, you know, pretty open and they want to talk about it. So I would just write them directly. Have you gone to Emerald Cup? Is that... Oh, yeah. Emerald no, I... Cup is an interesting one, but it's much more of a 
not so much of a learning experience. No, it's from, more like judging. Yeah, right. and judging and stuff. Yeah, it's you more see a lot of see, you see a lot of innovative products yep. in this place. Emerald so, Cup is another one. Another one. Yeah. And that's kind of a local, mm -hmm. locally local. grown thing. Santa Rosa. Grow up, grew up out. Of, yeah, well, it's in Santa Rosa now, but it used to be up in uh, Willits. Oh, okay. That's where it started. Uh, okay. But anyway, yeah, it's a local one. Another logistical question is. Would you say that indoor growing is going to become obsolete as legalization becomes more widespread? I'll jump on that one. <laughs> so no, it won't become obsolete because cannabis is wind pollinated and if your neighbor is growing hemp and isn't culling males, then that hemp will pollinate your cannabis. And if your neighbor's growing anything, any kind of cannabis, it's gonna cross pollinate, it'll, it'll change the productivity, it'll reduce the productivity, it'll change the product outcome, the way the, the product chemicals are expressed. And so the only way to control the genetics, if that's what you want to do, which a lot of people are going to want to do, is to have control over what pollen gets to the, the flower. You know? So it, it's going to be around forever. Yeah. Another question that is going back to maybe some of those more heavy hitting questions is, how would you frame the landscape of cannabis research in this country uh, respective to the opioid crisis right now? How do you think the op opioid crisis is going to influence the growth of the cannabis industry? Go ahead. I can do that if you want. Um, so, so the opioid crisis is, you know, it's a, it's a huge, the results on what happens in, if cannabis is put in that mix is a little bit mixed. Most of the results that I've seen show that you can reduce opioid use by 25 to 50% in a lot of individuals by removing some of the opioids and putting in some of the cannabinoids, and that would lead to fewer uh, people getting addicted to the opioids, but the opioids crisis is is not going away anytime soon, I don't think. But how is it going to influence? It'll help where it's allowed to. That's what I think. There's another question at the top now. It's about your lab, actually, uh, Dawn, Steep Hill Labs. But it's a little specific, so I'm going to see if I can maybe broaden it so it's more widely applicable. Uh, Steep Hill Labs is a lab that is expanding very quickly. What is the long-term strategy for a lab like that when it comes to being able to compete uh, with the rest of the country as more and more states become legal and as maybe federal legalization is on the horizon? Well... So do you want my opinion on what it should be? Or, no, I can't do that. All right, so um, I think you know, long-term strategy is uh, have a big footprint out there. Uh, we believe, like Vince does, that things are gonna loosen up worldwide, that there's gonna be a lot of trade, and that people all over are gonna wanna know that the results that they're getting from this lab and. We're talking to people in China, we're talking, to, you know, we got all over that. Those results are comparable, right? So that they can say, okay, well, this is what the market should be bearing for that product, right? And this is the safety margin for that product. So having that kind of a, an international footprint where there's a, you're comparing apples to apples, we think is, you know, going to lead to a, a benefit to everybody and hopefully our investors. Mm -hmm. So do you think that businesses that start in a state like California where it's legal are going to have to radically change their strategy if cannabis becomes federally legal or do you think that transition is going to be smoother than people might anticipate? It won't be smooth. It won't be smooth, it won't be smooth, smooth and I don't think no. it's predictable. You, uh, Right? You're talking about politics. Yeah. And some people in the audience would really like to know, uh, do you really think that gender doesn't 
impact your chances of breaking into the cannabis industry with your own venture? So from the entrepreneurial side, as opposed to just getting a job. Uh, well, th there are some very strong uh, female-oriented uh, groups in cannabis, yeah. and, and they've been there since the beginning. They've got some really good people uh, working on them. So there, there are. Does it affect? Of course, it, uh, humans are all biased. What can you do, right? But uh, there are some some real outstanding female-owned companies, and then groups that support kind of the entrepreneurial. Right. I was actually ready for this question, uh, so I've had some data good, on it. Good, I was making that up. Again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, th in the cannabis industry right now, thirty-six percent of all the executives are female versus traditional like businesses are 15 percent and those numbers obviously can grow now my own personal experience i see a lot of if we're talking about gender male female right i'm male i see a lot of females in the industry um, and i also see some of the best growers are female i don't know why that is and people don't know why that is but maybe because they're more attention to detail probably maybe they just really get into it and kind of really own it you know, because we as genders have different, you know, personality traits to a certain extent, right? But some of the best growers I've seen are, are female, if, if that's what we're, we're looking at. One of the best early labs in the cannabis industry was uh, run by Jennifer Murray. And so she's been at the forefront of kind of helping other women get started in various aspects of it and so on. So, I, you know, I, for whatever reason... Um, cannabis seems to be ahead of the curve in including women at that, at that level, as far as I can tell. Another question that's at the top that is a little open-ended, so I'll try and see if I can guess what they're trying to say. How can we invest in the industry, and I'll make it more specific too, for people who want to see the cannabis industry grow and succeed uh, how can people contribute, even if they themselves might not be directly working in cannabis, having their career in cannabis? You could buy the product. <laughs> that would be a first start, right? That would be supporting the industry. Um, I, don't, I don't know what else and, you could do. And when you say buy the product, that's from a state license. It's from a state license store. facility, of course, yeah. And over 21. So. <coughs> or 18 with a medical card. Right. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, you know, what recourse do we have? Vote. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Learn the issues, vote, try to get things passed on a local level, right? It's always easier to make some headway at the local level and then let that, that kind of thing grow. Um, there are advocacy groups out there for everything and find some that you agree with and do some work with them. Uh, yeah, that's about it. And a quick question that gets back into the personal realm is a lot of people want to know what did each of you study at Davis? I don't what were your what were your undergraduate majors? Talk about your experience, whatever you want to say. They can't pull our transcripts, can they? Yeah. I don't believe so. <laughs> you want to go Sure, mine's quick. So I, I got my bachelor's degree in chemistry from a small liberal arts college in Wisconsin, and I moved to UC Irvine, got my PhD in chemistry, really physical chemistry, but physical chemistry and analytical chemistry are always kind of linked. Uh, and then I got the job here. Well, I went to Germany for a year to do analytical chemistry, physical chemistry, but then came uh, to Davis, and I've been teaching and doing research in analytical chemistry and forensic chemistry and a little bit of biotechnology since then. Uh, I came into Davis as a biological science major, like 80% of all of the students that come into probably a university like this. And then after about a couple years, I realized that I was not good at biological sciences. So I changed and actually I was in the first class of landscape architecture um, at UC Davis, the very first class. We got certified and I was, you had to apply and I was one of the first people, which actually exposed me to a lot of the plant sciences, horticulture. We basically have like minors in horticulture. We had to take so many horticulture classes. We have to walk around the campus and they would test us and they'd be like, what is that twig from? And you'd be like, oh my God, I'm getting an F, right? It, just, it was very, very, very difficult at Davis, but great education. It's a landscape architecture. 
And keeping with the topic of majors, some people want to know, how can you get into the cannabis slash hemp industry if you're studying a social science degree like sociology or anthropology? Do you want me to take that? Why don't you take that one? Yeah. So, so, you know, if, if you're going to be hiring for a position, um, sometimes you might be looking for a specific role, right? And if it's something that needs a lot of experience, you're going to need that experience or that degree. But in cannabis, it's pretty wide open. There's a lot of different jobs. Um, what I've seen that what people have done is they literally just find somebody in the industry and start networking. Go to these events, meet these people. They need people, and they need good people, and they actually need well, I mean, I'll say it's smart people like yourselves, and they need people at that you know university level to say, look, you know what, I, I see a great things in that industry happening, and I want to be part of that. So, I'd just say the biggest thing you learn at university is how to learn. So it doesn't you know get your foot in the door. No matter what degree you have, if you can learn what you need to do the, the job and do it well, that's what it always takes. Right. Sometimes opening the door takes something special. Right. And uh, there's two questions that I think I'll combine them because they seem to be asking similar enough things. Uh, some people in the audience want to know any advice for people who want to op open a cannabis restaurant. And I suppose on that note, after you talk about cannabis restaurants, uh, general advice on how someone should go about starting a business in the cannabis industry? Yeah. So I'll take this as I've started many of them. Um, in terms of a restaurant, I actually know of cannabis restaurants or more pop-up restaurants right now. Um, you're going to need, I think the first thing you need to look at is actually if you're going to be preparing food and actually making people eat it, then you're going to need a license, right? So that'd be the first thing. So depending on where you're going to be, you want to look at the licenses, regulation. And then I don't see it any different. Once you have that, it's a restaurant. You're infusing it with cannabis, however you're going to do your recipes. That pretty seems pretty straightforward to me. General advice on any sort of cannabis-related business for people in the audience who might not have as much experience with how you start your own business? Sure. I can take that one, too. Yeah, that's I, it depends on, so, like, if, we're, if, we, if you're a student, you know, you're not going to have many contacts. You're not going to be able to influence a lot of people. You may. To, to give you money, right? So it's just going to be, if you want to start your own business, friends and family, um, I would have a solid business plan. I would have an advisory board of people who are in the industry that will help you and more help you not make mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. I still make a lot of mistakes with all my ventures. But especially if you're just starting off into the working world and you want to start your own cannabis business, you're going to want to have a team and a team of people who actually know what they're doing. So, you know, they always say, you know, you, want, you, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room, right? You want to hire people around you who know a lot more that can actually help you build that business. And it's going to be real difficult. I and mean, there's a lot of competition, right? Uh, just like with anything, technology companies, I was in technology before. Um, you, there are a lot of people, and especially if something that's really lucrative, people are going to be there, right? So raising money, networking, and the sooner you you know, build your networks, the better. They asked me this question, we kind of did a social media right before, and they said like, you know, what would you do if you were a student again, or how would you do life differently, basically? And I said, I would probably take more chances, I would probably fail more quickly, and I would actually just put myself out there. And it's hard because when you're younger and you're less experienced, you don't have that confidence, but if you could build that confidence, you can really do anything. You could do, definitely in cannabis, because it's so new. That's hilarious. We, we were interviewed separately in separate rooms, didn't know. That's exactly, oh, not exactly, but almost so exactly the answer? same answer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you gave it first, so I guess I copied you, but I didn't right. hear you. Yeah, that's okay. hilarious. All right, well, fail. Go out and fail. Learn from it. Yeah. Put that up on your wall. Those are the, those are the, the hardest learned lessons. They're the, the, the most effective, right? I, I don't know any entrepreneur. I'm, I have different ventures in different industries. I don't know any entrepreneur that hasn't failed at least once, right? If not multiple, multiple times. But when you hear about it, you only see the tip of the iceberg and see what great things they did or their company's doing so amazing. But you don't hear about, yeah, those five other companies that tanked before that. But those five companies' failures taught them a lot. 
So it's invaluable. The next question that is currently sitting at the very top is, what is your opinion on California's overly restrictive licensing program, which arguably pushes smaller growers out and corporatizes the industry? I am one of those small growers. Wow. You want me to take this one? I can, I'll, I'll say one thing, and that is oh, it, it's, it's politics. Yeah. I, I don't know how to explain it. it I don't think was the intent of at least some of the people in that were pushing for Prop 64 and things and the regulations, uh, but uh, it was certainly the result. Well, whoever that small grower is, you know, if you want to talk afterwards, I think unless you're my opinion, of course, unless you're a boutique and you grow a strain that everybody really, really wants. You know, it's like with any other business. You're the mom and pop store on the corner, liquor store, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, Safeway comes down the street. Well, that's kind of like tough to compete, right? So you need to figure out how you want to survive. Now, if I was in that situation, I'd partner up, right? I'd partner up with other growers. I'd get like six growers, small growers together, make one company so that we're stronger together. I would partner up with uh, dispensaries. So made sure that my product was always so sold to them, and I would make sure I protected the revenue stream. Because you're right, when the bigger guys come in and they have a lot of money, it's going to be very hard to compete. Well, and I think one of the things that has, has really come up in, in the cannabis industry in California is that because of the level of regulations and permit fees and local, and it, it's, it costs a lot of money and you need a lot of expertise even just to be legal. Yeah. It's not like growing vegetables and taking them to the farmer's market, which is kind of how it was envisioned and it didn't turn out that way. And that's, right. I think, one of the disappointing things. I have a lot of friends who were, you know, or people, acquaintances that uh, were doing black market stuff and started to come out into the open and then all this stuff came down and they're just like, I, I can't, I can't do it. I'm going back to the black market. Right. And this is a question that's targeted at Vince. Uh, do you own, if you do own stocks or options in the cannabis industry, what kinds of stocks and options do you own? And can you speak more generally uh, to the decision-making process when it comes to deciding this is what I'm going to invest in, this is what I'm not going to invest in. Can you speak to your decision-making process a little bit? No, that's a great question. So I personally don't own any stock in any public markets. Um, and the reason being is I've met a lot of people who started those companies. And just like in the tech boom, I, I saw this when I was coming up at your age, um, what will happen is a lot of the investors will want to exit out of the, the stock. So what you saw was the stock price is just rocketing up, right? Hot industry, money coming in. It's just nirvana right now. But then what happened is then all the investors sold their shares, right, to make the profit, dropped the stock, and then everybody's like, wow, it just dropped 30%. I'm not buying into that. And it just keeps dropping. Now, what's going to happen is with anything, it's going to mature. So then they're going to start looking at things like they should have, like revenues, growth, you know, per, you know, per, potential revenue, these types of things. But, I, you know, if you want to invest in stocks, my opinion is you, you just want to get a company that has solid revenues, a good business model, right, that, that, that will work in this industry today. And you're going to want to ask somebody who really knows it. Um, and realize that there's a lot of risk. A lot of risk in cannabis. I mean, the thing is, if I was to buy a stock, like one that I, that I like, turned into stock talk, is actually um, on the CBD side, there's a company called Charlotte's Web. They're public, right? Their stock, I think, dropped from 24. It's down at six now. Um, kind of an overreaction to the whole, they thought the hemp market was going to go away and CBD was going to be outlawed. Well, that obviously hasn't happened, right? But they have solid revenues. They've been around for 17 or 18 years. Um, and they have a great, great company. And if you've ever seen their products, a lot of people use their products. I mean, it's probably the favorite of a lot of my um, friends. Um, they, they buy Charlotte's Web. 
I think this question is complementary. It's what are some of the innovations in the pipeline right now that most excite you personally? Innovations in the pipeline. Um, well, I don't, I don't, I don't really have a good answer for that one. Innovations in the pipeline. You got something? Yeah, sure. sure. So. It, it, the, the industry is so new now that it's really trying to find itself and baselining all the different products. What I find is exciting is all the other states, all the other countries that are starting to, to legalize cannabis. Because what that's doing is that's pushing innovation up. Because now you've got more people doing it, you've got people researching, and then you'll be able to tr trade with different countries. So everybody will be able to create their own different strains. I, I was at the conference and I met the people. They're the only grower in Mongolia right now and they have their specific strains. So it's going to be kind of like the wine, the wine industry someday, where you know, you'll get grapes from Italy, you'll get grapes from Spain, right? Same thing. You'll get cannabis from Mongolia, from Colombia, from Peru. And I think that's where the innovation really is in the industry, is actually growth. I, mean, I think um, uh, just, just kind of to add to that, the, the one innovation that I can think of from the science side is learning the genetics enough to, th this plant, there's a, there's a whole host of compounds that this plant produces in, or can produce in significant amounts that no other plants on the planet that we know of do that have significant medicinal properties. And the THC and CBD are the only two that most people know of, but there's a whole bunch more that are you relatively unique to this plant that can be produced, but we don't necessarily have the genetics available or don't know quite how to get to those genetics. So there's a bunch of stuff that way that I think will come out. <coughs> and especially if we're allowed to do the research to prove what those things can and can't do. Right. And another question is, what are some good resources for learning more about uh, the hemp and cannabis industry, keeping up with latest news on the industry, educating yourself, or some educational resources that you would recommend? Uh, the, the kind of the starting spot for just understanding kind of the, the plant itself is probably the American Herbal Pharmacopoeia, I think 2016 monograph on cannabis is the latest version, the 2016 right. I think is the latest one. So that's a really good resource. It goes everywhere from you know insects and diseases to strains to pesticides to just amazing amount of information to get a get a background on on what is cannabis and hemp and you know what are the the things that you can do to make it grow or not make it grow. Um, there's, yeah, there's numer numerous books or publications that you can read. I mean, they have all different subjects. Um, there's websites such as Leafly, um, and they do a really good job explaining different things, and they actually have little videos um, that will show and explain uh, graphically, um, sort of like the different CBD or cannabinoids. Uh, it's pretty interesting, actually. Normal is another really good resource, N-O-R-M-L, right? And they were an early activist since the 60s um, in trying to get Cannabis normalized and legalized. Um, NCIA and CCIA put out kind of more regulatory and, and yeah, that kind of stuff. Like a newsletter they put out. National Cannabis Industry Association. Yeah. There's a lot of newsletters you can yeah. sign up for that bring up all the recent current news about cannabis. So. And for those that don't know as much about the actual production side, what do you use to grow cannabis and what are some of the different ways that cannabis is grown? Some of the major ways that it's produced right now? Soil and water. So, soil and water, <laughs> but also you could, you know, some people use, use hydro hydroponics. Uh, the, the thing that I've seen that's really interesting now is a lot of people are going to aeroponics. So aeroponics is actually just shooting air with all the nutrients into it. And it's, it's actually really interesting. It's fascinating because the, the, um, the roots grow like spaghetti. It looks like pasta growing all over it. And the reason being is it's less likely to get contaminated because they say with hydroponics, once it gets into the whole reservoir, and it's, if anything gets contaminated, it's going to go into everything. 
because it's all feeding off one source. Yeah. So uh, most people growing cannabis probably start with what are called clones, which aren't really clones. They're cuttings, right? They have the same genetics as the what's called the mother plant. And uh, so it's an easy way to get started. You can buy clones of fairly well-documented strains with fairly well-documented properties from dispensaries and you know, nurseries, I guess. Um, but they don't, they don't grow a taproot, and so they grow a little different. Um, so if you grow from seed, you get a taproot, and it's a little more vigorous plant and so on. Um, but there, yeah, I mean, it grows pretty well, right, without a whole lot of effort, right? But if you want to maximize and really make sure that it gets to the end and you got something to show for it, then you got to be a little bit, a little bit careful. One of the things to keep in mind is that uh, if you're going into the regulated market where it's tested for things like heavy metals, that hemp and cannabis tend to be, uh, tend to uptake those kinds of toxins from soil and water, and uh, so you got to make sure that what you're using is clean, right? And uh, there are lots of pests that certain strains are, are subject to, caterpillars, thrips, aphids, nematodes. Uh, so there's a lot that can go wrong. And this question is geared towards you, um, Don, which is, to avoid the problem of plants that have too much THC, do you think that CBD production will move towards uh, production in bacteria or yeast? I have no idea what that question is asking, but I will well, assume that you do. Certainly, almost everything that you want to produce like that is, is somehow genetically engineered into bacteria or yeast, and there's lots of people working on that. Um, and the only reason that anybody cares about these small amounts of THC is because of the regulations, and I think it's more likely that, well, I think it's about equally likely that somebody will figure out how to do that in bacteria or yeast on big scales, because they've figured out how to do almost everything else that way. Um, and, but I think that the regulations are going to change so that if you grow hemp and it's you know 0.4% THC, that nobody's going to care anymore, right? But I don't know which is going to come first. We only have time for a couple more questions. I'll try to make them good ones. Uh, the one at the top now is, should growers who are lying about genetics, which uh, is a problem for the consumer, uh, be something that labs should be checking for, along with issues like mold, insects, potency, et cetera? Essentially, should labs also be fact checkers? If the regulators want it, and then somebody's got to pay for it, because uh, I'll tell you what, if it ain't required by regulations, nobody wants to pay for it, right? Uh, do you care if you got something that's called Blue Dream, but it's really not Blue Dream, but it still gives you the same effects as Blue Dream would? I don't know. Uh, so the only way to do it uh, accurately is genetics, right? So you can do genetic testing of cannabis strains and identify, but who, who's, who's the authority? Who gets to say that this blue dream with this genetics is real blue dream, but this blue dream over here with different genetics, well, that's not real blue dream, that's fake blue dream. Who right. gets to say that? Mm -hmm. right. right now, there is no authority, no Appalachian or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. so it's tough. And, <laughs> and frankly, I'm just going to put one more plug in for testing. Same exact genetics. Uh, challenged by different stresses, gets you different chemical profiles. And so mm -hmm. same come from the same mother plant, two clones, one gets caterpillars, one gets nematodes, different chemical composition in the terpenoids, less so in the cannabinoids. But. Yeah. I'll ask the one in second place because some people want to know what your favorite strain of cannabis is. But I don't know if that's a question we can ask. Maybe after the I'm event. I'm willing to answer. Are you going to ask that strain? You going to ask that yeah. question? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, sour diesel is a good one. What do you like? <laughs> Old school, huh? Yeah, well, if you can get I, my it. My favorite strain is the one they actually developed for me, and, and I used my nickname from college. So that's my favorite one. What's your 
Night, night train. Night train, huh? Night train. Right. There we go. Not many people can say that. No, they can't. <laughs> uh, let's see. Jack around. Yeah. I think I will ask two more questions uh, and save the broadest one for last. Uh, the next question is, what is the state right now of children who are using cannabis to combat life-threatening diseases? The example this person gave was cancer. We all know that uh, THC products, for example, are available to adults undergoing chemotherapy treatment. What do you think is the current uh, stat uh, status of children and, their ex and how accessible cannabis products are to them if they're facing similarly life-threatening illnesses? Well, I, I think that there's always been access. Uh, I think the good news is, right? I mean, there's always been black market. There's never been a time when you, you couldn't walk a few blocks in uh, most cities and the right area of town and come up with cannabis if that's what you wanted, right? The prohibition does not work, never has, never will, right? For alcohol or cannabis or tobacco or whatever, right? So it's always been available. The good news is now, hopefully, it's available in a form that's tested so you actually know what's in it and know that it doesn't have pesticides and other stuff if you go to a state, right, permitted store. Uh, boy, there's just not much research out there. Uh, you know, if, if people are grasping at straws, they're grasping at straws. Um, there are certainly anecdotal evidence and some animal studies showing reduction in, in tumors, slowed tumor growth. It depends. So I've seen uh, where it, certain cancers respond better to THC than CBD or not at all to one, or one of them makes it grow instead of shrink. It is uh, not something I would recommend for the faint of heart. It's probably only people who are grasping at straws to for whatever is, you know, their final hopes, um, and I definitely run into those kinds of people. There are things where the CBD, right, so the CBD, well, there have been, obviously, GW Pharmaceuticals has a product that has been approved by the FDA for treatment of seizures in fair, and, and fairly rare but persistent cases of, uh, of epilepsy-type diseases, seizure-type diseases. Uh, but beyond that, what do you got? You got Sativex is approved in uh, in some European countries for I think pain and re uh, relief of some symptoms of MS. But uh, in terms of what's out there and what's approved by you know the normal government agencies that we look to to say this works and this doesn't, uh, there's no, there's no there's info out there. Yeah. And the question that I'll end with is. What are the biggest questions that people in the industry are actively researching right now? I guess to build off of that, what are the white spaces, just more generally, that people can move into? Places where there's the most work to be done, the most uh, discoveries to be made. What are those opportunities? Well, I'll start. I, th I think you know, Don alluded to it as genetics. So to, to create some new genetics that are really stable, that the market will want, that's one. Um, well, there's there's a whole host of things, right? Like the, right, but, and then what we just mentioned about if, if you could if you could possibly manage to do some like animal and human clinical studies to prove or disprove that we need research, right? Uh, the ability to do research in all fields of it. Uh, you know, medicine is one of the more important ones, but in genetics, there's you know. So this is something that a lot of people don't know about cannabis is there are very few even close to stabilized strains right. because everybody that gets a strain they like wants to make it their own and they take whatever they got and they take something else that I don't know how they decide on what male to use, but then they mix it together and I got a hybrid. Well, okay, well, it takes about somewhere around 10 generations for that to stabilize. Right. So. None of it is stabilized. They, they all produce multiple phenotypes. Um, but if you want to grow fields and fields of hemp that's all less than 0.3% THC, you need some stabilized strains. And there's a few in the hemp industry that they say are stabilized, but they all go hot. 
Well, before we move on to our last few notes, can we please get a round of applause for our two speakers and the excellent talk they just gave? Uh, we're going to do a quick raffle right now for those of you who got a raffle ticket. I'm not looking. <laughs> Oh, um, is that Mar Maribel? Yeah, Maribel. Yeah, Maribel? There he is. <laughs> Congratulations. And before you guys head out, I will say once again that we do have a very, very short uh, poll on slido.com, the exact same place where you went to submit your questions. It's only three questions. Uh, please answer if you have time. It'll be open all weekend and it really, really helps us uh, with planning these events. And if you're interested in getting involved, uh, you can visit the links there. There's a QR code you could scan that will take you to a list of all of our relevant web pages and social media accounts. Uh, and I will also put out there that we are looking to recruit more students to help out with this series. So you can find more information about that on our website. And thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs>